the question is which of the following interpretation cannot be associated with a given radiograph read the question again it is cannot and not can so that means you are trying to eliminate the wrong answer amongst the following so three options are right and one option is wrong let me enlarge the image what you can let's talk about the features that you can see in this radiograph over here number one you can see that it is probably a third molar which is all placed almost horizontal in position and the roots are somewhat placed towards the ram, pointing towards the ramus it's a mandibular molar of course because it is bi rooted the second molar is also two roots so that means it is the mandibular teeth okay now in addition to that you if you notice in the radiograph this region there's one region where there is a radial lucency just below the uh, crown of the root so this is an indication that first of all let's uh, ignore everything and given the options we can identify for sure that this is an impacted tooth so impacted third molar is a correct option now whenever you have an impacted tooth the two most important complaints that a patient with impacted teeth come to you with one is pain and the second one will be uh, food lodgement now why does this food lodgement occur is because there is a flap that means your normal soft tissue which is present your oral mucosa which is present when you have the third motor which is partially erupted and it is partially impacted what happens is food can get easily get food can easily get lodged in that region now because food can easily get lodged in that region it is become it becomes difficult to clean due to difficulty in cleaning the soft tissues around the third molar get uh, inflamed they become edematous and they end up covering the tooth once they cover the tooth there is going to be a uh, impingement between the upper tooth and the lower tooth during occlusion this soft tissue when the patient bites the there is continuous irritation because the uh, maxillary teeth are impinging on this soft tissue growth and as a result there is trauma to that soft tissue growth eventually the patient starts complaining of pain because number 1 there is some form of edema and irritation due to the food lodgement and secondly the maxillary tooth has continuously been hitting the soft tissue and has caused been causing trauma to it and as a result the patient starts having pain so this entire situation that soft tissue which grows on top of the tooth is called as a pericoronal flap and the entire situation whatever i describe right now is what is called as pericoronitis when you have a patient who is having pericoronitis very frequently and very regularly you when you take a radiograph like i told you there is food impingement or food impaction that is occurring as a result there is going to be some form of uh, food that gets lodged between the second and the third molar or distal to the third molar in such a situation what will happen is it is difficult to clean so microorganisms get lodged over there they start fermenting and eventually they cause pericoronitis which leads to periodontitis and there is bone loss in that region and that is what is what you are seeing as a radial lucency over here below the crown to make it simpler i have another image over here if you see this the crown ends here and you have a radial lucent gap over here this radial lucency is basically an indication of bone loss and this is primarily that occurs something that occurs due to pericoronitis recurrent pericoronitis rather so in a patient in the radiograph that is given over here we have achieved that impacted third molar is something that can be associated with this radiograph in addition to that recurrent pericoronitis is also something that can be associated with the given radiograph now coming to the next two periapical cemental dysplasia and peripheral sclerosing osteitis this can be little confusing but there is one easy way to remember this the most frequent location of peripheral periapical cemental dysplasia is the mandibular anterior teeth whereas that of peripheral sclerosing osteitis is in the posterior mandibular teeth so your condensing osteitis usually occurs as a sequelae to caries what exactly happens is the caries lesion ends up involving the pulp from the pulp it goes to the periapical tissues now 
when a patient has a very good immune system what is going to happen is he start going to start lay down laying down more bone and because he is going to be laying down more bone the tissue the entire tissues around that entire uh, inflamed periapical region is going to become more dense now what is why is this happening is because the, since the immunity of the patient is good the bone is going to uh, bone if you have more bone formation the microorganisms that are present in the periapical tissue are going to take more time to dissolve produce acids and dissolve that much amount of bone so if you had a bone that was less dense it would have been easier to remove that bone faster due to acid attack however since the dense bone is dense over here it is going to take more time for the microorganisms to bring about their action and that is the reason why condensing osteitis or peripheral sclerosing osteitis is something that occurs in the mandibular teeth and in young patients because it is easier to deposit more dense bone since the bone is already dense over there so when it comes over here like i told you pericoronitis leads to some form of pocket formation in addition to that if the patient like i told you since if the patient has a very good immune system then over there you can have dense bone formation forming condensing osteitis on the other hand like i had already told you periapical cemental dysplasia is something that is very commonly found in the mandibular anterior region primarily the mandibular incisors so it is something again seen more frequently in women as compared to men and in between their 20 and 40 years of age that is the common age group that present with this condition so the patient is absolutely asymptomatic they will not complain of any situation anything it is more often than not an incidental finding what do i mean by that is a patient who is in the initial phases of cemental dysplasia will not have any complaints however when you take a radiograph routine radiograph you will notice a ra periapical radiolucent lesion now this periapical that means it is in the radio or rather it is in the radio lucent phase then you have a mixed radio lucent radio opaque and eventually it becomes absolutely radio opaque those are the three phases of cemental dysplasia so once it becomes absolutely radio opaque the mass then starts growing and eventually it can lead to a bony form swelling in the anterior region of the mandible so a patient who is actually complaining of uh, who is actually presents with cemental dysplasia presents at the later stage or at the latter stage of their entire disease process and usually for such a situation there is no treatment the treatment is usually very conservative you most of the times leave it as it is or if it is causing some amount of disfigurement then you try to remove the entire mass completely okay